Hi, I'm Stephanie Hobbs. I'm a senior at Poplar Bluff High School, and I go to First Baptist Church, Poplar Bluff. I'll be reading James 1, 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I am Denzel from uh, our bluff, and I'm reading uh, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 verse. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and, des and, de and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Amen. My name is Rashawn McComb and I'm a senior at Neelyville High School. I attend Living Word Baptist Church in Popper Bluff. I was not raised in a church home whenever I was younger, but before I ever went to church, God put someone in my life to watch over me, which was my uncle. He taught me right from wrong and everything I know. He was mainly the only good influence on my life. Since I was young, my mom moved me and my little brother and sister around a lot. So we couldn't really never make any friends and it was hard on us. By the time I was eight, I had moved to 11 different schools. And after all this, I came and moved in with my dad, and he raised me. Soon after that, I met my coach, Patrick Morton, who was a very good role model for me, and he was the one who told us to go to church and accept God, so I did. This is where I met my youth pastor, who has all also been a big influence on my life. Looking back now, back now at my past, I can see through my entire life, God has placed someone to watch over me. He was watching over me the whole time, even through some bad times, which I don't didn't mention. He has always been there for me. The reason I am such a positive person now is because since I came to know Christ in the 10th grade, I have always known someone loved me, and even whenever I thought no one did, he always will. No matter how I mess up, he will always forgive me, which puts a smile on my face. I believe he put me here to be a positive influence on other people's lives, and I am glad to do it because he makes me happy and gives me the will to live. So I want to spread this joy and cheer to others. I want to be the best person I can be because I don't want to go down the same road some of my family did, because I have seen what the devil can do and how he can manipulate people into straying away from God. A good go-to verse that I use now is 1 Corinthians 10:13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So when Satan tempts me, I know God is there for me. Thank you all for listening, and God bless. My name is Sophie Nowak, and I go to school at Westwood Baptist Academy, and I'm a junior, and I attend Christian Family Fellowship. And um, I just wanted to share with you guys how God changed my life. In the spring of 2011, when I was about 11 years old, I noticed that there was a cyst on the top of my finger. For those of you who don't know, a cyst is like this little sack of fluid in your body that isn't supposed to be there. Um, I had it removed that summer, but a year later, I realized that it had come back. We left it for a while, but it started to grow and it got to the point where it would hurt to move my finger. So we decided that I needed to get it removed again. My family and my church had really been praying for my finger and the surgery, and we had scheduled the surgery for two weeks after my initial appointment. On May 10th of 2013, I got it removed for the second time. I'm kind of skittish about surgery and needles and stuff, but God honestly just gave me this peace. And in 2 Timothy 1, it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 
It took a little over a month for them to get my lab results back, but the doctor finally found out that the bump on my finger was actually a rare form of reoccurring cancer, and that was why I had come back even after it was removed the first time. He also said that it could start to spread, and if it did, I could have years, or I may only have a couple months left. Um, to prevent it from spreading, the doctor wanted to completely remove my finger. Now, this would be bad news for anybody, but I play multiple sports as well as instruments, and that would put a permanent handicap on my life and a lot of the things that I love to do. To say the least, I was completely distraught. I didn't want the cancer spreading, but I also did not want to lose my finger. We obviously didn't like either of the options given to us, so we decided to go see a specialist in St. Louis for a second opinion. When we got there, they wanted to run some tests to see what if the cancer was still there and how quickly we needed to do something. We knew that God could heal me um, because in Isaiah 53, it says that by his stripes, we are healed. We finally went in for the test results and they came back negative. There was no sign of cancer anywhere in my finger or the rest of my body. This whole thing was incredibly stressful and traumatic to say the least, but I can honestly look back and say that I wouldn't change a thing. This, is, this situation brought me closer to God than I had ever been, and I realized how slack my relationship with God had become. It, had, it was more of a religion than a relationship, but this helped me to change that. I grew spiritually, and I now have a stronger relationship with God. My prayer life grew, and without praying and the prayers of others, this would have been so much harder to get through. In Philippians 4, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. This also helped me realize just how quickly our life can be over. Yeah, we say we know we aren't guaranteed our next breath, but when it actually happens and you're told you may only have a couple months left, everything changes. You realize just how much you've taken for granted and start to appreciate even the smallest things in life. In Jeremiah 29, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has showed me just how special everything and everyone is. I have learned not to take anything for granted, and I challenge you guys to do the same. Thanks. Hello, my name is Austin Wagner. I'm from Still, Missouri, and this is my third year playing baseball here at Three Rivers College. Growing up, I was always in and out of church and youth groups all the way up to high school. But after high school, I grew apart from God for a long time. Much like a lot of you here tonight, I believe I was saved, but I was living a life more satisfying for myself instead of for God. I thought being the guy that always got invited to the parties or always was part of that group would be pleasurable and make me popular. For a long time, I strived off of always having people around that I thought cared about me. Even when everyone was around, though, I, constantly had, I had a constant feeling of I was alone. Once I began going to some of the team Bible studies we had with the baseball team, began going to the church with my girlfriend and talking to an old baseball coach, the Word of God really started to work on me in many different ways. Just like a lot of you here tonight, as an athlete, a hunter, or whatever you want to be good at, you, you have to practice what you want to be good at. If I want to be a good baseball player, I have to take extra ground balls, I have to take extra batting practice, I have to stay in the weight room. If I want to be good at something, you have to put in the extra time and work in order to do that. A verse from the scripture that really made me understand and apply this to life is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. This verse really made me uh, realize the pleasures of what I was. What I was doing wasn't going to last forever. At that time, I knew that I needed to get right with God, and I knew that His love would always be satisfying. I know there's people here tonight, and even some teammates, they remember the guy I was, not even a year ago. But I hope they realize and see the change in me and realize that they can experience the same, same change. Since I came to know Christ, I no longer have the urge to want to go out to the parties or be the one that everybody comes to to find out what's going on that weekend or that night. But instead, I want to be the guy in the locker room that the teammates come to 
for when they need advice or just need somebody to talk to for whatever they have going on in their life. I wait, but after being that guy that I want, want to be, I wake up every day excited about the fact that I get the chance to be an influence to people and get the chance to change this person, one person's life that maybe they were living life like I used to. Closing, I knew the change that was being around the Word of God, around the people of God, and being able to encourage people to learn about the Word of God. That's the change I wanted to be and be able to help people do that. Knowing that the goal of Fields of Faith, I hope to encourage any of you to start reading the Word of God and get involved with the church with either somebody you came here with tonight or even somebody you know. It really made a big change in my life. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. My name is Katie Feller, and I'm a student at Three Rivers, and I go to Memorial Baptist Church. I was nine years old when I accepted Jesus into my heart, and I started going to church in the second grade. I was 11 years old when my grandpa passed away, and I didn't understand why God would take him away from his family. I was really upset and angry. When I told my mom that I was angry at God, she explained to me that he'd be pain-free and God would take care of him. After that, I loved going to church and learning about all the fascinating things God could do that I never even knew about. When I made it to junior high, I was bullied every day to the point where I didn't want to go to school, and I'd pray to God to help me make it through it and make them stop. I didn't understand why he wasn't helping me until one day I got the courage to stand up for myself, and they never bothered me again. I felt much better because I knew God could get me through anything. The summer right after my ninth grade year, I was with my sister and some friends, and we went to Wilcox Road. We went over the railroad tracks to turn around when the jeep stalled right on the tracks when a train was coming. Three girls made it out, and another girl and I was stuck because our seatbelts wouldn't come undone. One of the girls came back when the train hit, and two girls lost their lives. I didn't remember much that happened, but I have night tears, and I still, still do every once in a while. My leg had to be amputated because I went without blood flow for eight and a half hours, and I was in the hospital for five and a half months. The whole time I was wondering why would God let this happen to me, and why God would take my friends away from me and their families. I had so many questions for God. I prayed multiple times for God to bring the girls back. I was also told I'd never be able to get a prosthetic, and I was really upset. I thought I would be different, and I didn't want people to treat me differently. I went to rehab to strengthen my muscles so I could still exercise and learn to transfer from my wheelchair. I learned new things every day. I improved quickly and stood on the parallel bars and rode an electric bike and became good at transferring from my wheelchair to a table. I was in rehab for a month and a half when they told me I'd be there for at least three months or more. And on November 9th, I went home. My thoughts changed and I was much happier and thankful for God healing me and making me stronger. I was even more thankful when I was able to get a prosthetic thanks to Andy and Hanger's clinic. And I learned how to walk and prove all the doctors who said I'd never be able to walk again wrong. <laughs> months after I got home, I started going to church again, and I've been going since then, and it's been three years. I still have days where I cry because I miss the girls, but they're with God now, and I know He's taking care of them. There's a verse I say to myself every day, 2 Corinthians 12, 9-10. But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thank you. Uh, what's up, guys? My name is David Branch. Uh, I'm from Orlando, Florida, and I play baseball here at the college at Three Rivers. And coming from Orlando, Florida, um, I had a lot of doubts about why I was coming to Three Rivers in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. 
It's 15 hours away, and um, Austin, that question ran through my mind, and others were like, how successful will I be here um, in my time here? And of course, these are selfish and insecure thoughts, um, but doubts we would all have at one point in our lives. What I did not know at that time was how much my faith was going to grow and be challenged while I was here. I was originally saved when I was seven years old after the Easter service at our church. I went to church all throughout my child and adolescent years. The problem was I had slowly become indifferent and complacent with my faith. It was not until last summer, uh, back in Orlando, when I was going to a college group uh, there. And I had been asking the Lord for growth a lot lately in my life. I knew I had become complacent and indifferent and lukewarm, which is, is not where you want to be uh, in your relationship with God at all. And the first night I went there, the college pastor there was preaching on a conversation Jesus had with his disciples. In this conversation, Jesus asked them, who do you say, who do the people say I am? Uh, of course, they respond with some prophet, uh, John the Baptist. And once they say that, Jesus gets real with them and asks them, but who do you say I am? And that's a question that I was challenged with that night. And, and one that ran through my mind day after day. Who does David, who does David Branch say that Jesus Christ is? Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, responded with, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Sure, I was saved, but did my life reflect that statement? Was Jesus truly Lord of my life? How did the gospel change my life? Ever since that night at college group, my life, and more importantly, my heart, has moved from selfishness, insecurity, doubt, and into a people-driven and purpose-driven life. Of course, I am not perfect. Just ask my roommates sitting up there about how many times I have left the stove on. But those things that held me back from being the man that I was called to be in Christ, they're not my identity anymore. And at times I struggle with them, of course, but my identity is now in Christ. Whether I'm, I'm in the dorm room or on the baseball field, I live to glorify Him in all that I do and all that He does through me. My challenge to all of you sitting in those stands tonight is to answer that question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? And that question cannot be answered by your parents, your grandparents, your coach. You have to decide that for yourself. Tonight is the perfect opportunity to do that. And I challenge you to do that. It is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Please give it some serious thought. Thank you.